Good afternoon, and welcome those eight that have joined our church. You now can say, this is my church. You were saying that already, I'm assuming. And I understand we've had a full day, and we have a full belly, so I plan on being brief. So take your Bibles and turn to Philippians chapter 2. And I'll read verses 5 through 11, with our emphasis being 5 through verse 8. This is the word of the living God. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking upon himself the form of a servant, and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore... God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, those in heaven, those on earth, and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I'm certain that the majority here in this building are aware of the fact that this was a written, a written letter by Paul the Apostle to the church in Philippi, to people that believed upon Jesus Christ and baptized, joined to the church, and they were called Christians. And Paul wrote this letter in a prison. He sent it from his prison cell. And I want you to notice that if you read through the Philippian letter or if you have read through it, you don't see the apostle complaining about the harsh life in jail due to him being there because of the fact that he was a preacher of the gospel. He wasn't there because he was a murderer or he didn't pay his taxes. He was there because of the fact that he had preached the gospel. And instead of him complaining, he seeks to instruct, to encourage, to build up and comfort these believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, he does indeed touch on his prison life, his, his chains because of the gospel, um, but the reason that he was there is because of this message of the gospel. God's message to sinful men that they needed to be reconciled to God by faith in Jesus Christ and repentance unto life. And even though Paul was threatened with death, he said to live as Christ, to die is gain. He was not going to be fearful in preaching in the face of of death, something we probably don't know very much about here in the United States of America, but persecution comes in different areas. But nevertheless, Paul was going to maintain regardless of his prison life. He also had two options. To depart from his cell, to die, and to be with Christ, which he considered to be much better than the prison life, or to remain in jail, to remain in this life, and to minister and to help these Philippians in their growth in grace. He was not thinking of himself. He was thinking of others while he was in the prison cell, that these Philippians might grow in grace, have the joy of faith, have the hope of eternal life. Now, in view of these truths, he teaches in chapter 1 and verse 27, he says, Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Okay. So that's one of those passages that is an obvious, immediate application to be ready, let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. And then when you go to chapter 2 and look at verse 3 and 4, and I purposely didn't read that, but let's read that now, verse 3 and 4, because this is how we are conduct, to conduct ourselves in the gospel of Jesus Christ. He says in verse 3 of chapter 2, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for the, his own interests, but also for the interests of others. So the question is, okay, this is what we are to do, verse 3 and 4. What's the motivation? What's the example that we're to have? And then Paul continues on in verse 5. And brings out the prime, the, the, the prime example of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So really, if you're looking for a title of this message, it's really 
Let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, how is Paul going to bring that home to them? Well, he begins in verse 5. And he begins with the mind. He says in verse 5, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, which is quite a tall order. Now we get to get into the mind of the Lord. And the only way we can do that is by his word. In other words, what Paul is saying here is use your minds. You Philippians be thinking Christians. God never bypasses a man's understanding in order for it to hit his heart. It's got to go through his mind. He must be able to reason things out. What is it that I am to believe? What is it that I am to do? I am to think upon something. Because as a man thinks, then he believes, and then he does. And the prime example is Jesus Christ. As it says, let this mind be in you, which is also in Jesus Christ. Well, what specifically are we to think upon with regards to the Savior? Well, it's found in verse 6 and verse 7 and in verse 8. In verse 6, who did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Okay. In order for us to understand what our Lord was thinking, the mindset of the Lord... We need to be mindful of the Lord Jesus, his nature before he came to earth as while he was here on earth, after he became man. He was equal with God, being in the form of God. He was face to face with God, as John says, and he is God, infinite, eternal, unchangeable, self-sufficient, receiving praise from angels. The Lord of glory, creator, lawgiver, judge, savior, and worthy to be praised. He had all the perfections of God the Father. He was all powerful. He was all knowing. He was everywhere. He was indeed the Lord of glory. And yet he became man. He became man. And though he was a man, he did not consider it robbery. He did not consider it wrong to be equal with God. Our Lord did not steal to get his deity. He always has been the Son of God. God manifested in the flesh and became the Son of Man. He did not obtain his deity unlawfully. Because of the fact that he was in the beginning with the Father, face to face with the Father. And he proves his deity in his ministry by his word, by his miracles. He could heal across distance. And even the word of God describes Christ's nature as being God manifested in the flesh, as well as his many wonderful works. Now, when one puts together a sermon... Each pastor has something in his mind. And for me, because I'm weird, I usually consider us being on a journey. We're on a path, so to speak. And so we're going to come up on this path, and there's a little street here. I want us to go on this little detour, and this will bring us back. This will help us understand our Lord's deity, if you will. So please bear with me a little bit, a little detour. We've been reading through Exodus. We're eventually going to get to Leviticus. And we've been reading through the Old Covenant in our afternoon service. And one thing that, is, stands, that, one thing that really stands out is, is the approach to God in the Old Covenant was very serious and very specific. Uh, we've been reading here about how Aaron is going to have to dress. And it's got to be Aaron, or it has to be someone from the Levitical priesthood. There were specifics in the Old Covenant before someone could enter into the presence of God. They had to be dressed a certain way. They had to have the temple set up in a certain way. There were certain sacrifices that had to be done. Uh, there had to be the proper timing of when those sacrifices were offered and when they could go into God. And if they didn't do it, they died. Remember, it is lest they die. So it was a very serious thing to try to approach God because you have to consider the fact that God is infinitely holy. 
His justice cannot tolerate sin. It cannot. Nadab and Abihu found out the hard way. They offered up a sacrifice different than what God had ordained, and God burned them up right there on the spot. Wait a minute, these are God's people. God is not to be trifled with. And whenever the people rebelled against Moses and God was in the camp, he would send a plague out and he would kill thousands of them. When Korah, who was a a Levitical priest, but he wanted to be an Aaronic priest, and he tried to become that type of a priest, God opened up the ground and swallowed 250 of them up. This same God became man And they didn't die. They didn't die. Jesus is a mercy of God, from God, being God and coming to take upon himself human flesh and become a man. Now in verse 7, some of your translations may say, but he emptied himself of his privileges found himself of no reputation. This is, this is difficult, and I, I want to be as reverent and as direct as possible. But Paul here is demonstrating here what the Lord did. He humbled himself, but he did not empty himself of his deity, since all the fullness of God dwells in the Lord Jesus Christ bodily as he was fully God and also fully man. Emptying himself, though, is something that he did. And here I'm being as reverent, and words fail me about exactly what, what happened to our Lord, what he did. He, his glory was covered, if you will. And I, I, I can't think of any other better word to say, except, except to say that it was, it was covered. It was out of the sight of sinful man, even though the rays of the Lord Jesus' deity broke out in several ways, sometimes in his miracles, sometimes in his words. One that stands out is when he was going to be arrested by those Roman guards. And they want to know if he was Jesus of Nazareth. He says, I am he, and they fell back. Now, these were not pencil-pushing accountants. No offense, Sean. They were not wimps. These were battle-tested, tough guys. These were soldiers. And yet, just a glimpse of our Lord's deity breaks out and they fall back. And yet, somehow, someway, our Lord held that back. He held that back when dealing with men. Many didn't see our Lord as fully God and just saw him as nothing more than a sinful man. And some did indeed see his deity. Thomas fell down before him and said, My Lord and my God, after he rose from the dead. Instead, many, even the Jewish leaders who should have seen our Lord as the Messiah, thought him as nothing more than a sinful, illegitimate child. He humbled himself. He humbled himself in the form of a servant to his heavenly father as he was faithful and obedient as well as a servant to his people. He ministered to them. He preached the gospel to them. He was the gospel to them. He did them good. He even washed their feet and cleansed the souls of the elect. As a servant, He secured these Philippians' salvation. As a servant, he secured our redemption. One of my writers in my study said this, admire this awesome drop from heaven's glory to a servant. Our Lord Jesus went from the palace to a dirty, stinking manger. Those little mangers you have around Christmas time, they don't stink. They look nice, they look cute. Hang around animals a little while. They stink. That's what our Lord did. He went from being king to a servant. This demonstrates humility. He emptied himself. He humbled himself. He comes in the likeness of men. Without sin, he led a perfect life of obedience 
to his father for the benefit of his people. Which gets us to verse 8. And being found as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death. The Lord Jesus was and is the Son of God, perfect and never sinned. And yet he was treated as a sinner, even though he knew no sin. He had the same flesh and blood of us, without sin, same reasonable soul as us, without sin, fully God, fully man. He was subject to sorrows, pains, griefs. He wept. He was tempted. He was reproached. He was persecuted. And eventually, he died. Death is humbling. Just watch someone die. There's no dignity in death. Watching life being pulled out of a man or a woman or a child is humbling. All that Boasting that they may have had before has gone right down the toilet. Excuse the use there. But there is no dignity in dying. It is humbling to die. Our Lord did that. But he went a step further. Paul brings it out. He says he became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. He died on a Roman cross. Crucifixion was probably the most painful, humiliating way for a person to die. Slap you on a cross, they put nails into you, you're naked, into the feet, they raise you up on that cross, and the victim is doing everything that he can do just to stand so he doesn't shrink down and drown in his own fluid and blood. We get our word excruciating, by the way, from the root, from the word crucifixion. That is what our Lord went through. Condemned as a criminal, hung between two felons, naked. Death is one thing. A slow, agonizing death is another thing. Sometimes it took days for someone to die on a Roman cross. As a side note, just remember that the thief on the cross, the thief that was on the cross that was converted, they had to come and break his legs. It just says that in the text. They broke his legs. Now, how do you think that happened? They did it the old-fashioned way. Some type of an instrument, and they're pounding on his shins. So they break so that he sinks down and he drowns in his own blood. Very appetizing. That is the way crucifixions were. Our Lord suffered crucifixion, but the physical crucifixion, and I want to be very careful here, the physical crucifixion of our Lord, and I say this with all reverence, with all sobriety, in one sense was a heaven compared to to what our Lord went through with divine wrath being poured out into his soul. The wrath of Almighty God for sinful men that we could not see at the time. The only thing we saw was the Lord Jesus saying, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The infinite wrath of Almighty God being poured out into the soul because of the sins of all of God's people being placed on the Lord Jesus as well as the guilt of all that being placed on our Savior Even the hymn that we sang today, Stricken, Smitten, and Afflicted, we talk about the physical crucifixion. The deepest stroke that pierced him was the stroke that justice gave. Divine justice, divine wrath, infinite wrath for a set period of time placed upon the Lord Jesus Christ. It's one thing for someone to die for the sins of guilt of one person. We feel that sometimes, our sin and our guilt. Imagine that being multiplied to the number of the elect being placed upon the Lord Jesus Christ, who is not only God, but is also a human. He was flesh and blood. He suffered, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And yet, he said, when he was able to do this, accomplish redemption, he said, it is finished. It is finished. And as a result of that, we have verses 9 through 11. My purpose is not to expose that particular text, but to say this. Because of the Lord's humiliation, his obedience, 
and his service, God has exalted his name above every name. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to Jesus Christ. All ways of salvation are only found through one, and that is through the Lord Jesus Christ. He is King of kings, Lord of lords, right now. He is ruling and reigning right now. He is building his church right now. He was humble to the point of death, the death of the cross, but God has firmly, and in a, in a, in a way that amazes us, has made him to be our salvation. He is highly exalted to him. What's the point of all this? Remember, let's go back. Verse 3 and 4. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition. Lowliness of mind. Let each of you consider others. Do not be considering your own... The, I mean, you should consider the needs of yourself, but also consider the needs of others. The main point of this passage is let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ in a very specific way. In your mind, you should be thinking of humility, which gives birth to obedience and service. That is what he is telling these Philippians. Obedience, service springs out through humility. A famous passage in the book of Habakkuk. I'm certain most of you know it. The just shall live by his faith. We know that. It's even quoted in the New Testament, right? But you know that's only half the passage? Do you know what the first half says? Behold the proud. His soul is not upright in him. But the just shall live by faith. You, did you see what the writer did there? Behold the proud. He's not humbled. The just shall live by his faith. It's assumed that he is going to be a humble man. The grace of God makes someone humble. See the difference there? Our life as Christians, that's who I'm speaking to right now as Christians, should be one of humility. And that humility is born out in our praying. We bow the head. We bow our soul. We seek after the Lord. It's not a 15-minute ordeal one time a day just to get your, quote, devotions in. It is, a, it is a walking with God. Yes, we should have a time when we get alone with God. Yes, we should be in our prayer closet seeking after the Lord. That takes humility, though. Because what we are saying when we pray, first of all, is that we are praising the Lord. That He is our everything. He gives to us life and breath in all things. He has saved us from our sins. And we praise the Lord that his justice has been satisfied. His wrath has been turned aside. We renew our peace with God by faith in Jesus Christ. We pray, we bow before him. And we acknowledge when we pray that we can do nothing apart from him. Can you imagine a minister standing here behind this desk without bowing his head and seeking the Lord daily for prayer? Take that man out of the pulpit. We should all be seeking the Lord in prayer because of our great dependence on him. I've been a Christian for 30, 40, 50 years. You still need the Lord. You still need the Lord. Young man asked me if I still sinned. I said, you have no idea. I am more concerned with my sin now than I was 42 years ago. I am more grieved at my sin than 42 years ago. Seems like my past is, you know, dogging me, behind me. <clears throat> Christian is one who's not perfect. He's been humbled by the grace of God. And he seeks after the Lord in prayer, knowing where his salvation comes from. From this one who humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Humble yourselves, my dear brethren, under the mighty hand of God, casting all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. Humility, service, obedience. Let me be more specific with us because I'm preaching to us. I'm preaching to me right now and there should always be application. I'm sure you can draw the, the dots there and make the connection with regards to application. But we should, as a, as a people, be humble towards one another. Uh, consider others better than ourselves. It'll stop us from fussing and fighting with each other if that happens. It'll stop us from being on the internet fussing and fighting about political issues. And we have so many wonderful examples in our church 
of how we serve one another. Our deacons do a wonderful job. They're always working. The young ones that help our deacons put together the tables and the chairs, that's not very spiritual. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Young guys, you don't need to be sitting around talking about theology after the service. That's a good thing, but maybe help the deacons a little bit. They would probably appreciate that. Our ladies in our church is a strength. The way that they, I love the way they they take care of the food, especially the main one, Karen. She's amazing. Someone should marry her. We're married. But the ladies do a wonderful job. They sacrifice not to come in here on the first Sunday of the month. Why? So we can have food and, and to partake of food. Many ladies go and help. Isn't that wonderful? And whenever there's a need, the ladies, they are there. Whatever need it may be, they'll do a meal, whatever, or pray. Call them on the phone. Our ladies are a strength in our church. If you haven't joined our church yet, the ladies alone should make you want to join this church. They are a strength in our church. Now, I've embarrassed, you know, 85% of the ladies here in this congregation. But that should be an example towards all of us of how to serve one another. They're not blowing the trumpet. They're not preaching. But they are serving in a way that God has given to them. So I would say, fathers, there's many good examples around you of loving fathers. Love your, love your wives. Love your children. The question that I ask you fathers is, would you be willing to die for your wife or your children? Oh, yes. Well, would you go shopping with them? I hate shopping. I hate shopping more than I like not like shopping. And there's a difference. I hate shopping. But okay. Fathers, we need to be servants to our families. To love our wives to love our children, to train them up, have those time of devotions, make those devotions to be enjoyable, not a 15-minute ordeal as if you're taking them through the tribulation period, but it should be something that is enjoyable. Enjoy your family. And fathers, we are to be servants to our family, to the brethren here. Remember, our Lord washed the disciples' feet for a reason. Make your devotions plain, make it interesting, Make sure that you are a servant. I have this written down. Okay, so I'm just going to read it. I'm, I know that door I can get out rather quickly. But guys, change a diaper every now and then. Do some dishes. Break the iron out. Help your wives out. Do a little shopping. Do a little cooking. I'm a lousy cook. We'll learn. Do something. Train your children as well so that your future daughter-in-laws are not calling you after your sons have married saying, what kind of a louse did you raise? This guy won't do anything. I don't think that's going to happen. I hope not. I haven't got a call yet from my two daughter-in-laws. I hope that doesn't happen ever, Brian, Kyle. But be servants to one another. Wives, love your husbands. Obey your husbands. I didn't make a mistake. Submit to your husbands. God is giving you husbands for your good. You need to be humble in obeying your husbands. Remember the Lord Jesus humbled himself and obeyed the Father. Just as the church submits to Christ, even so the wives are to submit to their husbands. Not a very popular thing these days. And wives, make sure that you love your children, take care of your children. Singles, help out around the church. As I mentioned earlier, you can talk theology later. Help the deacons out. Deacons do a great job. And there's two guys, I'm not going to mention them. They actually stick around until everyone is gone out of this building. And they're not walking around shutting lights off and on while we're out here enjoying each other or you know, pulling one of these numbers as they walk by. They do it humbly. I'm not going to mention them. Great example. We have many good examples here in our church. Pastors, we are here to serve the people of God. I'm talking to six of us right now and those who aspire to the Christian ministry. We are servants. They don't serve us. We serve them. We shepherd the flock. We love the flock. We make that phone call, that uncomfortable conversation we may have to have because of the fact that we serve the Lord Jesus Christ. These sheep belong to Christ. We as pastors, we take care of them. So all we do is we take care of them. Anything that they need, they need to step on our face, go right ahead. 
whatever it takes to take care of the people of God because they believe to Christ. They belong to Jesus Christ. And of course, a way of humility is our tithes and our offerings. We, we, we provide support for the pulpit here by our tithes and our offerings. Do it cheerfully and do it as unto the Lord. If I could put an exclamation point on this point, on this last point, I'm actually going to quote a Roman Catholic Democrat. Like everyone's going, what? I'm going to quote a Roman Catholic, and he was a Democrat, and he said this, ask not, you know the rest, what your country can do for you, but rather ask what you can do for your country. It's common grace. I'm going to borrow that from Mr. Kennedy. I was around when he said that. But all seriousness, my dear brethren, don't ask what the church can do for you, but rather ask, what can I do for the church of Jesus Christ? Because inasmuch as you've done it to the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interests of others and consider Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for how you have put together churches. We give you thanks and praise you that our our desire is to love you and to love your people, to grow in grace, and we give you thanks and praise you for the additions that we've had today, for our years of being this church, Trinity Reformed Baptist Church. We give you thanks, O oh Father, for the attention that your people have given to your word. We thank you that you've been good to us. We pray that you would now seal these words to our souls, that you would make us to be imitators of our Savior. Pray that even as we partake of these elements, that your people would grow in your grace and knowledge. So hear our prayers. Do good to our souls. Yeah, look to you as well for the continue on, continuing here of this service. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.